911, what is your emergency? He said he heard noises and talk, and he thinks that there's shooting going on at the school. Okay, we do have police on scene at the school. Police is on scene there. Is it secure? We don't have that information as yet. According to the National Center for Education Statistics, it is expected that pre-kindergarten through grade 12 enrollment will increase by an average of 3%, from 50.4 million in 2015 to 52.1 million students by 2027. The states expected to grow the most in this time frame are Alaska by 13%, Texas by 15%, Washington and Florida by 17%, and North Dakota by an astonishing 27%. Today, grade school, whether public or private, is highly regarded in America and in other countries. Websites like Public School Review conclude that the potential benefits that parents reap when choosing public school over homeschool include financial advantages, higher degree of independence for kids, extracurricular activities that might not be available to homeschool students, and freed up time for parents. Backed by the federal government's word, parents are encouraged to enroll their children in the public school system. In this future, we must enrich the mind and the souls of every American child. Education is the civil rights issue of our time. In the U.S. Department of Education, Strategic Plan for Fiscal Years 2018 to 2022, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVoe states, When confronted with any decision at the department, my first question is always the same. What will most benefit students? In the same words as Secretary of Education Betsy DeVoe, this documentary will explore what will most benefit our children through the lens of the Bible. To better understand the public school system, let's first consider its origin. So how did the public school system become so popular in America? In order to study the origins of compulsory education, one must look to 1712, when Frederick the Great was born to Frederick William I in the Kingdom of Prussia. Young Frederick had the reputation of a sodomite. In 1730, he tried to escape from his father's Prussian rule by fleeing to England with his presumed sodomite conspirator Hans Hermann von Kott. Frederick's father, who once referred to his son as an effeminate fool, learned about the plan and had von Kott beheaded while Frederick watched. Frederick served in the military in 1734 before joining a satanic secret society known as the Freemasons four years later. He was initiated on August 14, 1738 at Brunswick with the assistance of the Lodge at Hamburg. In 1739, he founded a lodge in Rheinsburg and in 1740, he sat as master of a lodge in Charlottenburg. Later, he was crowned the King of Prussia in 1740 at the death of his father, Frederick William, until 1786. So he identified himself as Frederick the Great. After losing major wars, Frederick created a compulsory education system with one goal in mind, indoctrinate the citizens to fight for their country rather than preserve their own lives. The creator of America's public education system, Horace Mann, was an American educator who served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, which is part of the American Congress. Mann was the key reformer of the education system. In 1837, he became the head of the newly created Board of Education in Massachusetts, where he began the work that would eventually earn him the title as the father of American public education. After reading through the educational models of different countries, Mann heard about a particularly successful style that had been developed in Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany. The Prussian system had shown to be such a success for the government's purposes that, accompanied by a few other educators, Mann traveled to Germany to investigate. 
Upon their return to the United States, they lobbied heavily to have the Prussian model adopted. The Prussian system of state-controlled education extended from the lower grades through the university levels. Schools were established, supported, and administered by a central authority. The state supervised the training of teachers. Attendance was compulsory. Parents were punished for withholding their children from school, and efforts were made to make curricula and instruction uniform. This Prussian education system was transferred to America by globalist power broker John D. Rockefeller and his General Education Board, which funded and formed public opinion and political action. Rockefeller's efforts helped establish public schools for the general public today. By 1900, 34 states had compulsory schooling laws. Four were in the South. 30 states with compulsory schooling laws required attendance until age 14. As a result, by 1910, 72% of American children attended school. Half the nation's children attended one-room schools. By 1918, every state required students to complete elementary school. The turn of the century was a time of tremendous immigration, which brought a variety of languages and cultural traditions to the United States. American political leaders, using the public education system, attempted to merge the, quote, melting pot into a unified, forged society. Over the years, political and secular groups have exploited the education system to mold a non-religious society by funding initiatives and supporting anti-God political candidates. In 1979, the Carter administration transformed American education into a more centralized system through the Department of Education, a cabinet-level department of the U.S. government. In 2016, it had an annual budget of $68 billion. According to official documents, the department's function is to, quote, establish policy for, administer and coordinate most federal assistance to education, collect data on U.S. schools, and to enforce federal education laws regarding privacy and civil rights. In other words, it's a vehicle for the federal government to meddle with school curriculum and ensure that students are being sufficiently indoctrinated. 2009 saw the establishment of the left-wing Common Core program, which mandated certain, quote, standards for students in kindergarten through 12th grade in language, arts, and mathematics. In addition to the federalization of school curriculum, the program is designed to completely strip public schools of Christianity. In 2016, a former marketing executive for textbook publishing giant Pearson Education admitted that Common Core standards are designed to brainwash children into rejecting Christianity and embracing a distorted, myopic, leftist worldview. While being secretly recorded by a Project Veritas reporter, Kim Korber admitted that Christianity is totally out of Common Core and, quote, not a core concept at all. Meanwhile, schools are encouraged to mention other religions such as Judaism and Islam. Additionally, Korber admitted that the program is shrouded with corporate cronyism and that textbook companies intentionally and unnecessarily change content to sell new textbooks and make a profit. Ultimately, the globalist puppet masters in charge of the education system don't care about feeding the minds of future generations. Instead, they're using classrooms to propagandize children and defile their minds with wickedness. The school system is filled with atheists. Yeah. The school system is filled yeah. with people that do not believe God exists. That's right. The Bible says, you say, well, they're very smart. They're, they're intelligent. They are not intelligent. Not according to the Bible. The world will say those people are qualified and you're not. 
The Bible says those people are not qualified and you are. And the reason why is it starts off with the fear of God, with the fear of the Lord. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Bible says that if somebody says there is no God, that they're a fool. Yeah. Now you say, well, oh, they're very smart, they're very educated. They're a fool, the Bible says. Yeah. The Bible says they're corrupt. You're gonna have somebody that, that, that God says is a fool, that God says is corrupt. You're gonna put your children into their hands for hours and hours of every day, blindly letting them teach your children. And you have no say so, you have no, you probably don't even know what they'd be teaching them throughout the course of a daily, of a school day. Now, the Bible school teaches that God doesn't exist. You say, well, no, there are teachers out there that believe in God. But this is the thing, even if they say that they believe in God, they teach that the Bible's not true. They, do. they teach an evolution that is foreign to scripture. Look, they're not millions and billions of years old. Public school teaches that's against God is Darwinism, for one. To teach that this earth was not created, to teach that it's billions and billions of years old, to teach that we evolved you know, from a single cell amoeba or from, uh, from monkeys instead of man being creating, created in the image of God, that clearly is against God. You know, they're worshiping the creation more than the creator. So that right there in itself is against God. The, the science that people are trying to sell us today of Darwinism or evolution, it is not provable, it is not observable. Darwinism is a religion. Evolution is an evil religion. Look, the word evil in the Bible is not always associated with wicked, it's always associated with harmful. Evolution is a very harmful religion. It changes what you have faith in, what you have confidence in, what you believe about yourself and about God and about the universe and about the earth. Hey, God created this earth, right? Evolution, that system of faith, that religion is wicked. It is evil. It is harmful to the minds of the people that believe it. Look, to believe in evolution, you have to be a total fool. I mean, if you just, even just by the Bible says, just observing the things of this world, that, that those people are without excuse. You can look at nature, you can look at people, and there's no way that this just happened. For decades, the public school system has integrated and still promotes the teaching of macroevolution in the elementary school curriculum. Macroevolution is the theory that promotes the idea that humans evolved from primates. According to the National Center for Science and Education, the largest textbook markets in the nation lie in the states of California and Texas. Because of this, decisions made on textbook publications in regard to evolutionary teachings in these states end up being adopted by the rest of the country. Ever since the adoption process for biology textbooks began in early 2003, organizations like Mel and Norma Gabler's Educational Research Analysts have protested against the controversial teaching of evolution in public schools. In the past, any organization that protested against the evolution integrated curriculum had no success. Why is this? Because starting in 1995, the state legislature prohibited the board from making any edits to textbooks. Now the only areas they are allowed to enforce are threefold, satisfying each element of the Texas essential knowledge and skill standards, possessing good bindings, and maintaining books that are free of factual errors. Furthermore, in 1997, the State Science Standards, adopted by Texas Education Agency, TEA, mandated that students must learn about evolution in their curriculum. Initiatives are also being taken to teach children about evolution at the youngest age. Take for example the children's book, Grandmother Fish, a book written with the intention to teach young children that humans evolved through their connection to the grandmother fish. In one of the pages, the book accentuates how each kind of animal came about through the evolutionary path of another. The indoctrination of atheistic beliefs is not the only topic that Christian parents should be concerned about. When a private school closed its doors on six-year-old Madison Kinsdale, a public school welcomed her in with open arms. So this Madison, this girl, was the, the public, the private school she was going to kicked her out. So why would it kick out a little girl? Because it's not a little girl. 
it's a little boy that's transitioning over to a girl between pre-K and kindergarten. Listen to this. Madison transitioned last summer between pre-K and kindergarten, becoming the youngest child in Connecticut to change their gender designation on her birth certificate. When her mother, they keep calling it her, but it's really a boy. When her mother, excuse me, informed the private school in which her daughter was enrolled about Madison's new status, they made it clear that Madison would not be welcomed at Kate Kinzel, the name of the school. Devastated that the school that she had attended as a child has turned its back on their daughter. Kinsale recalled sobbing as she headed to the public school three blocks away. So she goes to public school. She goes to, to Babylonian Institute and they just, hey, come here. I had so much running through my mind, she explains to the mother. I had to keep my daughter safe and withdraw my son from the school that he loved. It was the Friday before school started, but within 10 minutes of talking to the principal, they had worked out a plan for Madison and her brother. I went from heartbreak to utter relief, confide Kinsell. There is huge, a huge fear in the parental community that, uh, about the day you have to sign up your child for school. Schools are filled with mandatory reporters, so we're not just concerned about our children will be turned away, we're afraid they'll be taken away. You're damn right they should be taken away. Yeah. You're transitioning your, your pre-K child over to be from a boy to a, a, a girl. A pre, how old is pre-K? Who knows, four years old? Can you imagine if a four-year-old came into school with a sleeved up tattoo? They would call CPS that quick. Yeah. You spank your children like the Bible says, they wouldn't call CPS. You teach them, look, they prevent people from naming their children certain things. But you can take your child and do an irreversible surgery to make the little tiny child. Do you think, look, how many pre-K kids are even worried about that sort of thing? Worried about the, the opposite gender. Is there being indoctrinated from a small child? You're not really, you like playing, you, you like playing with that doll? Well, you're probably meant to be a little girl. Look, little babies will play with anything you give them. Yeah. They don't know, they're just playing with, they're just, it's just toys to them. Oh, you like pink? We're gonna make you a. The same people will say, "Well, I don't want to take him to, to, to. I don't want to take him to church because I don't want. You know, they need to decide what they want to do on their own as re for religion." Well, why don't you let them decide right now? They have a. They have enough brain sense apparently that they can decide if they're a boy or a girl. That's ridiculous. Listen to this. May fifth, two thousand eighteen. Two elementary school districts in rural Oregon are pulling out of a statewide reading program because of a book about a transgender girl. Last week, a school in Hammerston, Oregon, pulled out of a statewide Battle of the Books competition, which is like this competition between the schools. Now, a school south of Oregon, the capital of Salem, the capital of Salem, is pulling out, according to the Eastern Oregonian newspaper. Principals in the Hemiston district said, one of the books on the elementary reading list is incompatible with the district's curriculum. So some people, even in this liberal state of Oregon, are like, hey, this is kind of getting crazy. This is getting a little bit too far. We're teaching transgenderism to our elementary school. Because what's the point of a reading program is to do what? Teach children to read, right? Yeah. But they're looking at it as another way to just slip in their propaganda. Yeah. And they're looking at it like, hey, look, this isn't about bringing in your, you know, your your social agenda and your social justice warrior hobby horse. We're just trying to teach the kids how to read. That's, it's funny, a lot of teachers, that's what they think they're doing. They think they're, they're there trying to help. They have a good intention. They want to teach the kids how to be educated, but they don't understand. They're under the control of an organization that's ran by the state government, by the government, to manipulate our children and to guide them in wicked directions. According to the newspaper, the issue is a book called George by Alex Gino. I looked up Alex, you know, he is a flaming fag. He's got like this one like thing of blue hair. He looks like a great big sodomite cabbage patch doll. <laughs> <laughs> it says, the book is about a child named George at birth who identifies as a female and wants to be called Melissa. Now I'm gonna read for you that if you go on the book George on the guys on this guy's website about how he's like what he's describing the book you know trying to explain to you what's the book is about this is not what they're saying this is what the guy himself says this book is about George when people look at George they see a boy but George knows she's a girl George thinks 
she'll have to look when Sona starts off by George thinks she'll have you know what I mean like you uh, you see where we're going the wrong direction George thinks she'll have to keep this a secret forever then her teacher announces that their class play is going to be on Charlotte's web George really really wants to play Charlotte but the teacher says he can't even try out for the part because she's a boy with the help of her best friend Kelly George comes up with the plan not just so she can be Charlotte, but so everyone can know who she is once and for all. George is a candid, genuine, heartwarming middle grade about a transgender girl who is, to use Charlotte's word, radiant. This is the reason why, this is the reason why these school districts, is not just the agenda that this book is pushing. The school district said, the superintendent said, quotes, when they said it was so much, it was not so much about the transgender issue. So they're not even saying, hey, it's not because they're promoting transgender issue. There are a couple of scenes in the book that they felt aren't appropriate for third graders. So it's not even just, they're like, look, it's not even just that they're promoting these LBGT, you know, rights. There's scenes in the book. They're putting graphic images there in the book that even the world rejects now. Yeah. That's got to be pretty bad. Yeah. They allow a lot of smut to go across public school libraries right. and a lot of smut yeah. to be called, you know, PG or G or whatever for that's uh, essential for yeah. a third grader. For it to be that, it's got to be really bad. In 2011, the National Center of Biotechnology reported that 75% of high school students reported having uh, using uh, dis, uh, addictive substances, including tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, and other illicit drugs. 46% reported uh, the current use of addictive substances, and one in three substances using uh, uh, students met with a medical criteria for an addiction. You know what's going on? I'll tell you right now. You know what's going on in the high school down the street? A bunch of drugs, a bunch of pornography, a bunch of alcohol. That's what's going on. I mean, you send your kids there, and they're just going to be around a bunch of kids that are going to be, you know, showing them filth, that are going to be trying to peer pressure them into smoking, into drinking, into taking drugs. That's the truth. Now look, the, yes, it's true. They will get a better education from a homeschool parent. But look, there are some lazy homeschool parents, obviously, that aren't raising their kids. But just not having your kids and that cesspool of sin is worth homeschooling them. Because the primary influence of a child should be their parent. But when you allow them to be in this environment, they're going to be influenced by the world. And look, we need to teach our children to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. According to the Monitoring the Future database, a survey taken in 2012, they said this, 24% of binge drinkers, high school seniors self-reported the following for one year. 24% reported themselves as binge drinkers. That means they drank five or more drinks in a row at least once in the past two weeks. 17% are current tobacco cigarette smokers. 8% misuse prescription opioids. 6.5% are daily and near daily marijuana users. One in five high school girls binge drinks. Almost half, 47%. 0.4% of high school students have had physical relationships, fornication. 22% of them say that it happens after using alcohol and drugs. That is where you're sending your kid. Not only are those enrolled in the public school system more likely to find themselves addicted to drugs, but the legal drugs prescribed to children by the school system can be detrimental to their future. The financial interest of the psychiatric industry is to feed this drug industry. And the drug industry's financial interest is to come up with the agents to feed the psychiatric industry. The psychiatric industry then is endlessly engaged in identifying new disorders, which can then be treated with psychiatric drugs. Now psychiatric drugs are the primary drugs that are consumed in, in America. Uh, one in five people, I believe, if not even higher than that, is on some sort of psychoactive drug in the United States.
That is very chilling when you realize the adverse effects associated with these drugs and the number of people that must be experiencing those adverse effects, which include predisposition towards suicide, predisposition towards violence. Is it perhaps the case that when we're giving one in five people these drugs and the effects are admitted by the FDA, shouldn't we expect aberrant behavior to be cropping up all over the nation? It's striking that there isn't outrage in the government and in the medical community over the fact that over a majority of those who have committed these school shootings have been on drugs, psychiatric drugs. And these psychiatric drugs are the very ones that the FDA admits increase the risk of suicide and violent behavior. So Adam Lanza was under psychiatric care. He had a breaking point where he went into the Sandy Hook Elementary School and he killed so many children. Now some say he went off his meds, some say he stayed on his meds. There's a strong public interest because we're talking about kids who appear to have problems of one kind or another, but there is no pattern in the sense of them having a clear connection. Well, maybe the pattern is in the drugs they're being given. When we got involved uh, on behalf of a group there that was interested in finding out the cause, we suddenly discovered that the coroner's office would not release any information that was of any significance. We ask, may we know the drugs that this person consumed? And we're told, no, you can't look at the records. Said to be because they're protecting privacy interests. Privacy interests of who? Not the person who's dead. Privacy interests of the family? There are no privacy interests left. The family's interests have been extinguished by the acts of the person who've committed this heinous crime resulting in the death of all these kids. This is a public crime of momentous significance to the entire community, and we're researching to determine what caused him to do this. We want the records. The records are now not subject to any privacy protection. Give us the records. We won't give you the records. So we sued the state, and we sued the coroner's office, and we asked them to produce the records. During the course of that proceeding, statements were made that were rather shocking. The assistant attorney general in the Lanza case argued to the administrative law judge that it would be harmful to the public to allow the information about Lanza out because it might cause people to not take their psychiatric medication. And that kind of argument is ridiculous. We don't deprive people of access to information. We defend their First Amendment right to access to information, and we depend upon them to decide what's in their own best interest. But against that is this huge financial interest of both the psychiatric community and the drug industry. If this did not exist, if there wasn't this huge lobbying presence, I strongly suspect that the coroner's offices would release the information to the public. I strongly suspect that there would be a thorough investigation on the state and national level. But in the case of these people, there's this enormous interest in suppression of information and censorship. Why would they do that? Could it be that there are drug company interests at stake here? That if America were to discover that the majority of these uh, kids committing these acts were on these drugs, and that these drugs have these adverse effects associated with them of increased suicide risk, of increased violent behavior, that they might think we ought to revisit this issue of whether we ought to give kids these drugs. The ride on a Tuesday morning in February began with a stern warning from 64-year-old Vacaville school bus driver Kim Klopson after an eight-year-old girl with autism temporarily blocked the aisle with her leg. You can get away with this, but not on my bus. And now you ready? Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Then the driver closes the door. We'll be right there. She's trapping her there so she can continue to be violent with her and to reprimand her and to yell at her. The teacher's aide walked away for three and a half more minutes. Klopson and the girl are alone. She rips off her jacket. No, 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 no. Finally opens the door. The staff member helps the girl off the bus. Klopson notices she has drawn a crowd. It's okay, I didn't hurt her, guys. I'm in your own life. Okay. Why the f*** y'all see after school? 
That should be interesting. You see this woman confronting a former basketball coach who she says sexually abused her uh, for many years, beginning when she was just in the sixth grade. Now that former coach is in jail here. Do you realize that you brainwashed me and you manipulated me? And that what you did was wrong? Yes. And I regret it. That is Jamie Carrillo, now 28 years old, talking to her former coach, Andrea Cardosa, in a phone call posted to YouTube a few weeks ago. Cardosa was arrested in Paris last night and is charged with 16 felony counts. Jamie says it started with Coach Cardosa kissing her in the locker room at middle school when she was only 12 years old and progressed to where Cardosa was taking her out of town, even to Mexico, to have sex with her. After Jamie posted her phone call to the web, another victim named Brianna came forward who said Cardosa had sexually abused her beginning at the age of 14 when Cardosa was a teacher at her middle school in Paris. Both women say through their lawyers they're relieved that the woman they say ruined their childhood is behind bars. A teacher in Pennsylvania has been arrested for attempting to have uh, sexual relations with an 11-year-old student. An 11-year-old female student. It was a female teacher by the name of Geraldine Alcorn. So the 28-year-old teacher is accused of sending more than 2,400 text messages to a female student where she expressed a deep love for the child and talked of running away with the minor. The Greene County prosecuting attorney told me that he's upset that it's taken nearly five months to make a decision about charging this teacher. Now the parents of this eight-year-old want justice for him and other children with severe disabilities. There was a couple of times that he didn't want to get on the bus and he fought us, didn't want to get dressed. And we didn't know. I mean, honestly, didn't know. What his father didn't know would eventually come to him in an anonymous letter. He says the letter indicated Austin's special education teacher was physically and verbally abusing him. When a child like him uh, is being abused in some uh, shape or form that he can't, you know, they can't come and, and tell you. You know, and to me, that makes it worse. Police documents that 41 Action News obtained show that it was reported to the principal that Austin's teacher, Janet Williams, tried to kick him when he was under a table and allegedly called him an idiot. One witness said the teacher slapped him on the back of the head and called him another inappropriate name. According to the probable cause statement, the teacher admitted to hitting him at least five times. If your children end up having some kind of a disability, if your children end up needing some extra attention, they're not going to get it. Look at verse number Daniel 1. Look at verse number 4. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. It's one of the good ones. Yeah. yeah. This is the reason why we have a family member, my wife and I, that that's a public school teacher. And she said when they have kids, they are not putting their kids in public school. Not going to do it. And the reason why is because the class sizes are getting so big compared to the one teacher to where the teacher, if you have a child with special needs, you have a child that has some sort of disability, they are going to totally get passed over. They're not going to spend the time. They're not going to sit there and take time and, and, and instruct them because they have so many kids to deal with. Do you know who they're going to deal with? They're going to deal with the ones that are just picking it up and learning it on their own. That's the ones that they're going to deal with. The other ones are going to get left behind. Okay? And you say, well, no, that's not true. They, they, they make sure they'll, they'll fail you. Look, they do not fail kids at school no more. When I was a kid, if you didn't, if you didn't do good in your grade, they would hold you back. Who remembers that happening? They don't do that no more. Do you know why they don't do that no more? Because the schools, they get funding from the government. And if they hold kids back, if they fail kids, then what it looks like, it looks like the school's not doing their job. So in order to get the funds, in order to make their uh, school look like it's doing a great job, they just pass kids. Yeah, they just pass them on through. That's right. According to the National Home Education Research Institute, Dr. Brian D. Ray states that of the estimated 686,000 children that were victims of maltreatment in 2012, almost half were preschool-aged children. 
Dr. Ray also found that there is an extremely small portion of sexual misconduct acts perpetrated by school personnel that never gets reported to the proper government authorities. Even when personnel are fully aware of the act. If that isn't disturbing enough, Dr. Ray says, quote, furthermore, collective bargaining clauses often allow for scrubbing of personnel files. So no record is left once an offender leaves the system. These practices allowing known sexual predators to quietly leave the district, potentially to seek work elsewhere, have become known as passing the trash or the lemon dance. With no criminal conviction or disciplinary record, predators can obtain new jobs and move on to other victims. On average, a teacher offender will pass through three different districts before being stopped, and one offender can have as many as 73 victims in his or her lifetime. Dr. Ray concludes that there is a remarkable rate of abuse of U.S. school children by school personnel, such as teachers, coaches, bus drivers, administrators, and custodians. It is not uncommon for it to take months or even years for substantial evidence to surface that there was a physical or mental abuse taking place. So what actions can Christian parents take to drastically reduce the likelihood of their children being indoctrinated into atheism and perversion? taking drugs, and being physically abused? The biblical answer is homeschooling. You are commanded to teach your own children. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates. The Bible says that all these times, thou, thou, thine, he is speaking directly to you. If you have children, it is your responsibility to teach them and train them. Not just of the way of the Lord, not just teaching them the Bible, but teaching them in every area of life. We see that it's mentioning just everything throughout the day, how these are all teaching opportunities. This is what parents have always done. And even when it comes to the things of God today, many parents feel like, I don't need to teach my kids the Bible. That's what they've got Sunday school for. That's what we go to church for. But as parents, it's your responsibility to teach your kids the things they know. The spiritual reasons to not put your children in uh, public school is <clears throat> they're teaching, they're trying to undo everything you do at church, uh, all of the good doctrine you teach your children. And uh, when you're teaching your children about God, they're teaching them the opposite. They're trying to teach them that there is no God, that, uh, you know, we, uh, they're trying to teach evolution which is uh, contradictory to our faith in the Bible. And uh, they're, they're damaging them spiritually, not just physically. We need to make sure that we are teaching them and we are not allowing them to be taught by the world. The foundation of education is the fear of the Lord. Notice what the Bible says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The Bible teaches us that the beginning of knowledge it begins with a proper fear of the Lord. You see, too many parents, too many Christian parents in the last generation, they just took their kids, they gave them up to the Christian school, and they thought that it was the Christian school's job to raise their kids. And it was the Christian school's job to train their kids. And it was the Christian school's job to teach their children the words of God. Hey, that's not good enough. Whether you actually homeschool or whether you uh, give your kids to a Christian school, public school, private school, whatever it is, you know what? You need to have the words of God in your heart and you need to be the primary teacher of your parents. Now, there are many examples of parents teaching their children in the Bible. Many, many examples. Look at Proverbs 4, verse number 1. Hear, ye children, the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. So right here we see in Proverbs 4, we see here the instruction, 
And the guy's even saying, look, like my father taught, because I was beloved in the eyes of my mother. That's why they taught me these things. The Bible says if you spare the rod, you hate your son. I'm telling you what, if you will not instruct your children, you do not love your children. Amen. You're just letting them pass through the fire. You're letting them do whatever you want. You say, I don't yeah. like that you say that. Well, that's just, that's the truth. Amen. Do you care about your kids? Do you care what your kids, not just what they think about life, but do you care about their future? When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Third generation, grandma, mama, and now Timothy. This godly heritage that he was handed. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Jesus look at Proverbs 31, 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows? Proverbs 31 is instruction from a mother to a son of a man that was taught biblical principles but even in the book of proverbs 31 he's saying look these are the attributes that you want to have these are what you want to look for in a wife one day this telling you how to live your life what to look for in friends what to look for talking about not avoiding drunkenness what to look for in a wife in the bible spanking as a form of punishment is an integral part of disciplining your children at many public schools, their form of disciplinary action includes, but are not limited to, detention and suspension. It is not the responsibility of others to discipline your child, but parents are commanded by God to spank their disobedient children. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Hey, how many people out there claim that they don't ha hate anybody? but yet they spare the rod on their child. What's the Bible say? They hate their son. You know what, that chastening needs to start early. It needs to start early on with that child. I mean, the moment that, that, that you tell them no about something and they look at whatever you were telling them no and they look back at you and you see them kind of reaching for it, trying to see what you're going to do. You know what, it's at that point that the chastening starts. Chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. The implication there is that there's going to come a time when there's no longer hope. So this is something that you have to do early, and this is something that has to start as soon as possible. Now, what I wanted to point out just after that is where it says in verse 21, there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. There are a lot of people who have trendy ideas about child rearing, and it seems like they're constantly coming out with new books and new methods for rearing children. All these devices out of the heart of man of new ways to discipline your children, or even this new movement that says don't discipline your children at all. Don't even replace spanking with a timeout. Just no consequences, no negative, and it almost sounds hard to believe but there are websites out there promoting this stuff there are books that are being written and if you look at the the facebook pages and the websites that are promoting this stuff they have hundreds of thousands of people that are buying into this garbage and following this teaching that says never have a negative don't even tell the child that they've done something wrong don't even say to them you've done wrong only positive, all positive reinforcement. And some of these people even claim to be a Christian. Now that we've established the Bible's perspective on homeschooling and child discipline, let's now consider the common hindrances Christian parents are confronted with when they decide to homeschool. You know, a lot of people would ask well, that don't homeschool, they think, well, I'm not really qualified to teach. Well, maybe, maybe I didn't finish college and they have a bunch of college professors up there that are teaching my little children. Listen, one-on-one -on -one with love and patience is better than any other method of teaching. Mama, you may say, oh, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not the smartest and I don't have it all figured out and I don't know how to do you know, geometry or whatever. That's okay. 
They have a book for mom and they have a book for the baby. Mom, read yours the night before and then teach them the next day. This is a fear that mothers have is I'm gonna screw them all up. I'm gonna mess up my kids. You're not gonna mess them up worse than the, than the public school is going to. Yeah. You say, well, like, what if they get to 18 years old and they can't do algebra two? It's okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's fine. What if they can't do calculus? What if they don't know, you know, they can't name every president in history? That's perfectly fine. Yeah. At least they're not going to be indoctrinated with evolution and pro sodomy and pro bestiality, which yeah. is coming, and pro everything Amen. else that's filthy and ungodly. Amen. It's wicked. Yeah. Yes. That's the truth. You're not going to mess them up worse than the public school. You say, I'm going to, I'm messing up my kids. Not worse than if you put them in there. They're still better off. Even if you kept your kid home and ended up learning not to read and write. They're better off. Then that's not going to happen. Yeah. That is not going to happen. That's what the world will tell you is going to happen, but that's not the truth. They say, well, I'm not smart enough. Well, look at verse number 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The ones that are built upon the sand, their storm came upon that house too. The difference is one stood and one fell. The, the sandy ones are the ones that people are trying to do it on their own, do it their way, yeah. do it with worldly wisdom. Yeah. They're trying to build their own house. The people are doing it on the rock, they're letting God build the house. Their labor is not in vain. Yeah. When you homeschool and you teach your children, you may feel sometimes like you're, like, you're, like you're walking on the escalator the wrong way, but it's not in vain. There, You will reap if you faint not. God's word says that those people that don't love the Lord, they are not qualified to teach. The Bible says you are a hundred percent qualified to teach and train your children. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. See, I don't know if I can do it. God said he'll strengthen you. God said he'll help you. God said he'll uphold thee. Why? Because God wants his heritage to bear fruit. God wants Christian people and their children to become godly another generation. That's what he wants. He wants you to succeed. Oh, they won't be socialized. They're going to be socially backward. Who's heard this one before? But honestly, you know and I know that a lot of the socialization that the kids are getting down at the public school is called losing their virginity. Yeah. It's called learning about drugs. It's called being shown pornography, okay? That's a lot of the socialization. But honestly, I submit to you that kids who are homeschooled can actually be better socialized than those who are in public school. And here's part of the reason why. We were just talking about this, but you know, when you go to public school as a kid, there's a lot of peer pressure, right? And you know, it's nervous. It's nerve wracking the first day you walk into a new school, right? And when I was a kid, I switched schools a lot. I went to a bunch of Christian schools, went to a couple of public schools. And I remember the nervousness of, of walking in to a school. It's your first day, you're really nervous. You want people to like you. You want to make a good first impression. You want to be in the cool group. You don't want to be in the nerd herd, all right? <laughs> so, you know, you're nervous. And here's what often happens, and you know this is true in school. Let's say you pipe up and say something. Let's say you uh, are outgoing and friendly to a kid. It's often rebuffed and you're mocked and made, you know, you stand up and say something, you'll often be made fun of, mocked and jeered in public school, right? I mean, if I were to ask for a raise of hand, who got made fun of when you were in school at some point? I mean, every single hand would go up, right? That everybody has gotten made fun of for something or some, you know, at some point you've been made fun of in school because kids in school are constantly mocking and making fun of 
and harassing each other. And so, you know, you want to fit in and be cool. You don't want anybody to make fun of you. So here's what happens. A lot of times kids that are from a homeschooled situation are more outgoing because they're used to speaking up and talking and not having somebody just shut them down and mock them and ridicule them. So in public school, you just kind of want to be cool. Just kind of keep your mouth shut sometimes. Don't say anything because you want to fit in and be cool. And sometimes people who come out of public school can be a little more socially backward than the homeschooled crowd. I'm sorry, but you know, I've been around homeschooling functions and homeschool PE classes and, and, and I know my kids are super outgoing and I find that a lot of homeschooled kids are very outgoing, very confident in themselves and able to strike up conversations with strangers very well. Whereas a lot of public school kids, they've been shut down so many times when they tried to open their mouth or be, you know, how many times? Hey, you know, hey, can I sit with you for lunch? It's like, it's taken. <laughs> Nerd herds over there, buddy. Like, Whoa, man, you know it's true. And so, you know, a kid whose spirit has been broken by just being shut down so many times and mocked and made fun of and ridiculed, you know, sometimes that can make you more shy, more backward than being homeschooled. You know, being homeschooled, you actually have a chance to kind of be yourself, be around your family, blossom a little bit. As parents, you need to look at the bigger picture in life. God doesn't want you to not be yoked up with unbelievers because he wants you to be unhappy. It's God sees the bigger picture. God sees that the end, look, a perfect example, in, in Proverbs 23, he says, not to even look at the wine when it is red. The reason why is because he says, at the last it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like an adder. God can see, look, don't even look at it. Why? Because at the very end, you're, it's not good. I can see the end from the beginning. I can see you as a 20 year old looking at it, desiring it. Well, I see you when you're 40 and you've been married five times and you've been out of jail for 20 years and you've got, you can't drive because you got 85 DUIs. I can see that in your life. And the way to prevent that over there, son, is to not even look at it. Amen. Well, the same thing, you as parents, you need to judge and say, look, I know it, it seems so innocent right now, but they're unbelievers. And for your well-being, I don't want you to become a 20-year-old, a 25-year-old that goes off into all sorts of wickedness and sin. And I'm going to cut it off right now while it's easy. You say, well, it's, it's going to be hard. The Christian life is hard. You have to be willing to do the hard thing to ensure the godliness of your children. And you can sit there and say, well, you know, you're sheltering your kids. They need to be exposed to this stuff anyway. Yeah, but do they need to be exposed to it when they're five? I mean, think about it. Are they ready to just be thrown to the wolves at five, six, seven, eight, nine? I mean, look, yeah, when they grow up, yeah, they're going to go to work and they're going to be around a bunch of heathen, but that's because they're an adult. But do we really need to take a little kid and expose them to that stuff before they're old enough to even process it or understand it so they can be scarred for life? You know, and there's so much we could go into in this sermon that, that's not even in here. Just the fact that, you know, 25% of girls when they graduate from high school are gonna say that they've already been molested and all, you know, we're not even talking about that. All the other reasons why. But honestly, we need to read the book of Proverbs and take a hard look at chapters one, two, and three, and then ask ourselves: does God want us dropping our kids off at the public fool system to be educated and taught there? Or does God want us to raise our own children and to teach them biblical truth, not the science falsely so-called of the school system, but actual biblical truth and real life skills and I'm sorry, but the average kid coming out of the public school system is not that smart. People will say, well, you know, it just, it's just too much work. It, it's gonna take way too long. And sometimes you'll hear people say things like, you know, I don't have six hours to sit there. Cause, cause they, you know, you send your kid to school for seven hours and six hours of that, they're in the classroom, right? So they say, you know, I don't have six hours to sit there and teach my kid. Well, look what the Bible says in Proverbs two, verse one. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. What's God telling us to do here? To incline our ear unto wisdom, to apply our heart, to cry after it, to lift up our voice for it, to seek it, to search for it as for hid treasures. Look, does God want us to put forth effort into this thing of knowledge and learning or not? He's telling us 
We should be begging for it, seeking it, striving for it, struggling to get knowledge and understanding. Say, ah, it's too much work. No, 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 it's work that needs to be put in, number one. But number two, it doesn't take six hours a day. And here's why. Because everything that the government does is inefficient. And school is one of them. Honestly, to homeschool your child only takes a few hours a day. And when they're really young, they only need, uh, you know, a, a half hour, an hour or something when they're real young. And then as they get older, it becomes two, three hours. Eventually it becomes four or five hours, but most of that they're working on their own. I mean, actual instruction time, they don't need a whole lot of instruction time because a lot of it is reading and studying and doing the work on their own. And it really only takes a couple hours a day to get this done. And you say, well, you know, you're just not teaching them as much. Well, here's the thing. They're smarter than the kids that are coming out of public school. They'll say, well, you know, the government is gonna come after me and, uh, and take my kids away if I homeschool them. Well, first of all, there's a huge number of people that homeschool. Thank God we live in Arizona, which is one of the freest states in the whole nation and which has some of the most lenient laws on pretty much everything. And so it's so easy here to homeschool. The only thing that you have to do to homeschool in Arizona, to my knowledge, is you pretty much just send them a letter, an intent to homeschool, or what is it called, an affidavit? Is that what it is? That the intent to homeschool, you just send it to them one time. I'm gonna homeschool, and they're like, okay. And then you never have to deal with them ever again. I mean, that's not that bad, is it? But the Bible says in Proverbs 29, verse 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare. Now, what's a snare? A snare is a trap. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. If we trust in the Lord, he's gonna keep us safe, the Bible says. But the fear of man is a trap, it's a snare. So basically we're scared of man. Oh no, if I homeschool, somebody's gonna come take my kids away. So I'm just gonna give them my kids every day for seven hours to do whatever they want with them and brainwash them however they want. I'm so scared that they're gonna take my kids away that I'm just gonna willingly give it to them. Well, but it's only half the day. Yeah, but that's enough to poison them. The other reason people don't wanna homeschool is, well, you know, my wife would have to quit her job. You know, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. And you know, do not do not ever make a decision. Just listen to me very carefully. Do not ever make a decision based on money. When you make decisions based on money, I don't know how much this is highlighted in the Bible. We see it in the life of Abraham. We see it in the life of uh, Isaac. We see it in the life of Elimelech. We see it all throughout the Bible. Whenever you make a decision based on money, just point, just, just write it down. You are making the wrong decision. It will backfire. The love of money is the root of all evil. It will destroy you, it will destroy your life. Just write it down. I sit in that office week after week and talk to people and tell them, you're making the wrong decision. Because you're making it based on money. And you know what, they go and do what they want to do and three years later, they're divorced. Three years later, they're out of church. Three years later, their kids are on drugs. Three years later, they're not serving God. Whenever you make decisions based on money, mark it down and you're making the wrong decision. The love of money is the root of all evil. It will destroy your life. So if your reason for I can't homeschool is my wife needs to work a job, get right with God. Amen. You need to cut spending. You need to get on a budget. You need to go do what you got to do. Sell your house. Sell your car. Your kids are the priority. Make sure, you know, don't sit there and say, oh, well, you know, we got to, you know, my wife has to work. Why? The Bible says that she's to stay home. The Bible says that she should be a keeper at home. And she should guide the house. A lot of people are afraid that they cannot survive as a single income household or with one breadwinner. But in most instances, if you took the average American family of a couple children, a couple nice vehicles, a nice big home, two jobs, two careers, and you cut everything in half, and you say, well, what happens if we move to a smaller house, we stop driving two brand new vehicles, and maybe dad buys you know, a cheap used car to drive back and forth to work. You know, mom's in a safe vehicle. And, and then, you know, mom is at home to cook meals. We're not always eating out, you know, cancel the cable bill, hello, right? If you cancel a cable bill and you cancel a car payment and you, and you save a few, you know, hundred dollars maybe on a house payment, all of a sudden your budget's gonna look a whole lot better. 
And you might say, well, yeah, but I mean, so what? We're talking about saving what? $300, $700, $1,000 a month, and that's what it takes, and then we can homeschool? What is the future of your child's mind and heart worth? If you could look back in retrospect, and you say, yeah, but we keep moving up. She got a raise, I got a new car, I might get the next raise. The kids are taken care of by, by the government. The government's taking care of the children. And then mom and dad's ready to retire and they're like, I just can't believe what they're up to. Can you believe what happened to their lives? I don't know what's gotten into their mind. Would you give it all back? Would you give it all back? Would you give that dream home back? Would you give that Mercedes Benz back and say, you know what? The heart of that child was worth it. I wish I could go back and invest in them. I mean, seriously, you're better off living in a trailer home than you are a mansion if your children love the Lord. And this is something that's been lost today. We're more worried about impressing our neighbors than we are in investing in our children. And listen, that's our responsibility. Cost of curriculum is between, and I've asked people, different people, we have littles, our oldest is 11 or so, and then we have some people that have high school. It's between one and five hundred dollars per student for curriculum. Now that's and five hundred is if like you go out and you just buy like the most expensive, newest, flashy curriculum. Um, it could be cheaper or it could be more expensive, especially when they're little. When they're little, I mean, you're pretty much just just teaching them the three R's. You know what I mean? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. It could be cheaper. It could be more expensive. Craigslist. I know my wife will, is always searching for homeschool curriculums where she can buy like. What would normally cost like $150, you can buy People try it out, don't like it, and barely touched it, and they'll sell it for 20, 30 bucks. If you're diligent, you can you can find it out. It's not that much, especially when they're little. I mean, you can buy books. Again, you're teaching them how to, you teach them at first colors and shapes and stuff, and then, you know, stuff, it's, it's not that hard. Now, the real reason why people say they can't afford it is not because of the cost of curriculum. It's because most families are a dual income family. It's because mom and dad both go to work. And I can't afford it means we need my wife's paycheck. I can't afford it for her to stay at home, okay? Now, people need to realize that they need to trust God's with their whole lives. And if you care about your children, you'll make sacrifice. The Homeschool Legal Defense Association commissioned a study from multiple standardized testing services. The national average percentile scores were higher in all subject areas for the homeschoolers by at least 34 percentile points and as high as 39 percentile points. The National Home Education Research Institute reveals that home educated students usually score 15 to 30 percent points higher than public school students on standardized tests. The National Home Education Research Institute states that the College Board reported that SAT scores for homeschooled students are significantly higher than the scores for those in traditionally schooled, uh, for their traditionally schooled counterparts. So even the world just statistically will tell you homeschooled kids are getting a much better education. In an article published in January 2018 by the National Home Education Research Institute, Dr. Brian D. Ray states that research on homeschooling indicate that those who are homeschooled typically score 15 to 30 percentile points above public school students on standardized academic achievement tests. The article further reads, quote, homeschool students also score above average on achievement tests regardless of their parents' level of formal education or their family's household income. Homeschool students also typically score above average on the ACT and SAT tests and are increasingly being actively recruited by colleges. Additionally, homeschool students are typically above average when it comes to social, emotional, and psychological development. Now that we've taken a peek at the horrors of the schooling system and read the biblical method of child rearing through homeschooling, let's now consider the testimonies of real people who experienced the misfortune of the public school system and those who found success in the homeschooling method. I'm Jennifer, I'm a homeschooling mom. I have six children, my oldest is 13 and my youngest is almost a year. And we first heard about homeschooling through Bible preaching and just when we looked into the Bible, we found out that um, children are a blessing and that if we raise them, train them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that they will follow the Lord's ways and it will be a blessing to have children. So we um, decided to do it and we've had as many children as God would give us since then. 
I grew up in a Christian household, and over the years I was able to go to public school, private school, a Christian school, and also home school. So I can speak from experience, and I say that my absolute favorite was definitely the homeschooling. I enjoyed the freedom of homeschooling. I enjoyed the time I spent with my family. We're a very close family, and to this day I can say that I still love and respect my parents, and I'm thankful for the sacrifices they made for me. There's nothing wrong with sending them off to school. You know, put your little five-year-old on a bus and just send them off, not knowing who's gonna interact with them, what they're gonna do, what they're gonna be exposed to, just that's the way of life. But no, it's not, it doesn't have to be. We live in America, we have choices, we can homeschool them. We have better alternatives. If you send them off to get educated, they're gonna get indoctrinated. And it's not just into the evolutionism that I talked about, they are going to get indoctrinated into the world's moral compass. And please look around at the world's moral compass and please tell me if that's really what you want for your child. Because if you look at the world, they don't care about purity. They do not care about protecting the hearts of young people. They don't care. But as parents, it's your responsibility to teach your kids the things they know. You need to create a home environment that will help them learn and help educate them. So if you really want to spend more time with your children and raise them, you know, really homeschooling them is just the only way to go. It really comes down to the parent and that's biblically, there's so many verses where it's the parent that's doing the, the correction and providing for the food and the shelter, the clothing and all of these things and also for education. And when the Bible talks about, you know, as arrows, their children are like arrows. They're, you know, it, we're, they're blessed if they have a quiver full of them. And uh, as arrows in the hand of a mighty man, the Bible says. And so, absolutely, children are supposed to be trained by parents. What it really comes down to is who has the authority. You see, as parents, God gave us the authority to train up our children and to bring them up. You know, and as Christians, we have the authority of God to raise our children up according to His will, you know, so they would be safe, so they would serve the Lord. Protecting my children's minds, their bodies, their purity, you know, the rest of their lives are being formed by what's happening in these early years. That's worth everything to me, any sacrifice to, to do what I can. When we're raising our children, we're raising our children to serve the Lord. And we want them to uh, to love God and to be able to be free in whatever they do to uh, to do what God asks them to do to witness and to read their Bibles and to share their faith and uh, and do soul winning. The main thing I think of when I think of why I don't send my children to public school is because once you give them authority over your children, you have to petition to get that back, and that goes with anything. So you have to stand your ground. We have a square that we stand on as Christians that the world has encroached upon in so many different ways over the years. And so many Christians are just giving that, that territory over. And once you give that territory over, you're not going to be able to get it back. And you know, as part of the independent fundamental Baptist movement, we're staying on these fundamentals. And those fundamentals are raising our children according to the Word of God. And the principles of our faith are the, are the foundation of our lives. And once we give our children over to the school system, you know, you have to ask for them to come back. You know, so if you want to take time to go on a field trip, now you've got to ask permission. You have to justify yourself to the system. You know, and I'm just not interested in doing that in any form or fashion. You know, I'm not rebelling. I'm just not submitting myself, myself willfully and willingly without careful consideration. And this is something that I've considered. The first step to getting out of the public school is to just pull them out right now. Get them out right now. I know there's a lot of concerns. I know there's a lot of things that people are worried about, but you need to just realize this is not a place for my kids. I don't have to be there. And you need to pull them out of there as fast as you can. It's as simple as just not sending them there anymore. It's as simple as not enrolling this fall. Just pull them out of there and don't ever look back. I'm just taking 
my job as a parent um, as serious as I can to just protect these children and make sure that they start off adulthood the best possible way that they can, not broken and disillusioned and worse. We really thought, you know, homeschooling and keeping our children with us at church, you know, with family integrated worship, then, you know, you're really able to raise your children to be people that you like, you know, and people who the Lord would be pleased with. So then we're fully responsible for the people they turn out to be, that it's really all on us instead of just whoever their friends are at school that they're around um, or even Sunday school. So. And a big principle in that is that uh, foolishness begets foolishness. And uh, the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And uh, so when you group a bunch of children together, you just get a multitude of foolishness. Different states have different requirements, but generally it's not that difficult to look on your county's website and see what the requirements are. And it's generally only a paper or two to fill out, you know, maybe meeting with a teacher once a year. Some, some states require a test, but you know, it's generally, it's not that difficult. If you can read and you can write and do some math, then you can buy the books, you can buy the curriculum yourself. A lot of people aren't aware of that, that I've talked to other moms who realize, who think that they can't buy the curriculum themselves, but you can actually buy the curriculum yourself online um, from the publishers. They all have homeschool departments that you can buy from and you can um, get the teacher's manuals and it teaches you as the mom basically how to teach your children. So you don't have to have a teacher's degree and know how to do everything. You can just look at the manual, see how to do it and teach your children. And there's so many different methods out there. I mean with the internet you can just look it up, you know, Google homeschool methods, homeschool, you know, different ways of homeschooling, and you can learn basically how to teach your children. It's not even an option for so many people because they're afraid of it or they don't even know, they've not been empowered, they don't know the truth about it, they don't have the knowledge to do it, they don't know what the steps are. I was homeschooled as a child, and so it was just something that I was, I really grew up in and I believe in, and I had always determined in my heart that I was gonna do that with my family. However, uh, you know, many other people, all they know is public school or private school. And they, this, uh, these other things just aren't an option. And so, uh, because of that, they are, you know, frustrated and it's not even on their radar. So what we're saying is, hey, there is another option. And that is just parents training their own children. You gotta decide what your priorities are. Do you wanna raise good kids? Or do you wanna have nicer cars and a bigger house. I would rather live in a smaller house. I would rather drive older cars and me be able to teach my kids the right way. You've got to prioritize, you can do it. And at the end of the day too, it is God commanded the man to be the breadwinner, the man to work. And you know, the Bible says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And in the Bible, we see a typical work day was around 12, a 12 hour day. You might not be able to do a 40 hour work week, but you know what? Be willing as a dad to step up and do that extra work, whatever it takes, so your wife can be where she belongs, she can stay at home, and she can train those children and educate them, and you will be glad you did it. It will be a great investment that you'll never regret. I learned by watching my dad as the sole breadwinner of our family that as a man, it's my responsibility to take care of my wife and my children. And today in society, we usually send the woman off and she gets a job also and people look forward to the vacations and the bigger homes and the bigger cars, the newer cars, things like that. And I thank God that I was able to learn this lesson from a young age that an older car can still be a blessing, especially if you don't have a payment. And I'm thankful that I learned the biblical method of being a man, and that is to take care of your family so that mama can do her job. What's important in life, you have to really ask yourself that, you know. Um, a lot of times it comes down to a wife really getting the job, you know, I've known this to be true about a lot of situations, the wife just gets a job so that the family can really go to Disney World and, you know, have the big vacation and all that kind of stuff. But as your family grows, uh, your priorities change and just being together, you know, having just days that where, where you go out and you do things. and. 
all those types of things, those are, those are very special. Not to say you can't go on vacation and you're just going to live a hermit's life for the rest of your life, but it's just, it's just kind of perception because the world tells you you have to have like this, a, a, a newer car and they look down on you if you have, you know, uh, you know, they'll call it a junker. You know, why is it a junker if it's still running? You know, and it's going to, you know, it's been running for years. It's not a junker quite yet because you still got life in it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, they just have a perception about, about things. And a lot of that is superfluous. Um, you know, don't, don't worry about image. Don't worry about status and all that kind of thing. It's not worth scarring my children for me to go out and get a job and make more money and live in a bigger house. It's just not worth it for us to be able to go on vacations. You know, we make do with what we have and we plan trips when we can, but it's just not worth it. In homeschooling, you set the pace and your children that advance faster in certain subjects are able to move forward. And the, the child that you have that you need to spend extra time with on certain subjects, you also have that freedom to make sure that they're able to grow. Being able to basically make our own curriculum has been something that we've really enjoyed. You know, not even just sticking to the one publisher's curriculum. You know, we might choose one curriculum in one subject, another one in another subject, and then we'll just make up our own for certain things that, you know, we just, you know, things that we want to teach them. If I want to teach my daughter how to sew, you know, I don't have to buy a sewing curriculum because I already know how to sew, so I can just sit down and teach her that. You know, whereas if she was in school all day, I, there's no way I would be able to teach her that skill, you know, during the off hours, you know, and same with my husband with um, skills that he's able to teach our sons, you know, he's able to do that because we have more time with them because they don't have all the homework at night. They're doing all their schoolwork during the day within a few hours, you know, three to five hours maybe, then they're done with you know, whereas a regular child that's at school would be there all day, plus would have homework at night, and you just aren't going to have the time with your children raising them that, you know, that you have as a homeschooling parent. Homeschooling's better. They're getting more one-on-one -on -one attention. That parent who's teaching them cares very deeply that they actually learn and get a good education, and so they're going to make sure they actually understand these things. Uh, most homeschool kids, they're taught morals, they're taught to have some character, they live by certain biblical principles that's going to help them across the board in their life, so they are just naturally going to do better than a child that's being taught that they came from a monkey, a child that's being taught not to have any morals, that everything is okay, whatever you feel like doing, do it. The, the homeschool kid's always going to do better in those situations. The Bible says that you need to teach your own children. Don't delegate this to someone else. Don't be afraid. You can homeschool. You're capable. There are so many resources available to you. There's so many different types of curriculum that you can use. You can custom tailor this to your child. Your child will be better off if you're willing to do it. You won't have to be worried what happens when they go off to a public school. You won't have to worry about them being abused mentally or physically or spiritually. God will bless you if you determine in your heart that you're going to teach your children and you trust the Lord to help you give them the best education that they can get. And that comes from their very own parents. Don't be afraid, you can do this. Even though you may be fearful at first, just know that you know your child best. You know what they like, what they don't like, what they need work on, what they're excelling in, what encourages them, what discourages them. And don't ever be afraid that just because you don't, you're not strong in a particular skill, that the child will also not be strong in that skill. I don't know the first thing about playing piano, and yet my daughter just finished her first recital recently. There is so much out there for the parent today that wants to homeschool. There are programs, there are curriculums, there is an abundance of free resources on the web, through the library, with any subject, with any hobby, with any interest. It's out there and you are the best person to put together this plan for your child. It's an exciting chapter in your family life, one that is very unique and it's very fleeting and once it passes, you'll never have that opportunity again. And if 
you need encouragement, if you need support, just reach out to someone. There are so many groups online and in person that you can reach and maybe have fellowship opportunities or go on field trips together or just encourage each other when maybe you're having a bad day or you're doubting yourself. I love homeschooling and I could not picture my life any other way. And so if you're on the fence, I encourage you to take that leap Take that leap of faith. It's going to be okay. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be memorable. It's going to be life-changing in the lives of your children and your family in general. And parents, if you did not get the education during your school years that you deserved, now is the time. Now is your chance to take it back and be an example for your children of learning when you're older. Learn it together and be a team. It will bring you closer. It's a sacrifice worth making, and the return on this investment is priceless. I would tell someone who's, um, who's considering homeschooling, but is maybe not sure if they can do it, you can do it. Don't be afraid, you know, you're just as smart as any teacher out there. You can definitely do this. If you get the books, go online, find the curriculum, you know, there's a lot of great curriculum out there and you could get it and you can do this. These are your children, you love them and you want to raise them for the Lord. So I would encourage you, you know, anyone wanting to do that to definitely homeschool your children. It'll be worth it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Who will have all men to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of the truth. God wants all men to be saved. But in order for them to get saved, they have to know what the truth is about salvation according to the Bible. There are four things you have to believe to go to heaven when you die. Before we get to those four things, let me just share a few scriptures with you, just so we're on the same page. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It means all have sinned means nobody's perfect. Sin is when we break God's commandments. The Bible says thou shalt not steal. If you take something that don't belong to you, that's a sin. If you lie, that's a sin. The Bible says there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. I Meaning there's not one single person that goes around and only does good and never ever sins, never messes up. Nobody's perfect. And because we sin, the Bible says we deserve a punishment for that sin. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Because we sin, we deserve death. We deserve to die. But it's not talking about a physical death, like we deserve to be executed for lying and for stealing. It's talking about a second death, a spiritual death in a place the Bible calls hell. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verses 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the first death would be if my body died. The second death would be if my soul went to hell afterward. The Bible says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So up in heaven, God has this book. It's called the book of life. 
If when you die, your name is in the book, you go to heaven. If your name is not in the book, you go to hell. Now, the guy that showed me this, I asked him, well, who's in the book and who's not in the book? And in Revelation 21, 8, it actually gives us a whole list full of sins, and it tells us what our punishment is at the end of the verse. It says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the Bible says, even if all you've done is tell lies, the Bible says, you have your part in the lake of fire, which means you deserve hell as well. Now that's bad news. God doesn't want us to go to hell. He wants us to go to heaven. He will have all men to be saved. This is what he did so that way we can not go to hell and that way we can go to heaven when we die. It says in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us. It means he gave us his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God looks down from heaven. He knows every sin that you've ever done, that I've ever done. 2,000 years ago, we sent his son, Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He went around doing amazing miracles. He fed the poor. He healed blind people and deaf people. He proclaimed to be God in the flesh. Now, he did the miracles to prove he was God. He raised people from the dead. But he not only did a lot of good things, he spoke a lot of truth. Now, people don't always like to hear the truth. So they had him arrested. The Bible said that they beat him with the whip. The Bible says that they, uh, they plucked the beard out of his face. They said that the Bible says that they put the crown of thorns upon his head and they made him carry his own cross to the grave. That'd be like if I hated you so bad, I kidnapped you and tortured you and at gunpoint, I made you dig your own hole. Then they crucified him, which means they stuck one nail through each hand and one through his feet and they hung him up on the cross and he died. Now, three days after that, the Bible says, his spirit went back into his body and he bodily rose from the dead. Hundreds of people seen him and then he ascended up to heaven. Right now he's standing at the right hand of God the Father. Now the Bible says that he died for everybody. And people may ask then, well, is everybody just going to heaven or is there something that we have to do? Well, here's the difference between the people that go to heaven and the people that go to hell. The Bible says in Romans chapter six, verse number 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it says that eternal life is how we get to heaven. If you have eternal life when you die, you go to heaven. If you don't have eternal life, you go to hell. Now it says that eternal life is a gift from God. Another word for a gift is a present. Like let's pretend this Bible cost $1,000 and I wanted to give it to you as a present for $5. Well, then it would cease to be a gift. Or if I said, I'll give you this Bible as a present for $1, it would cease to be a gift. Or if I said, you don't owe me any money, but you have to help me mow my lawn and fix my car. In order for it to remain a gift, it has to be free. Now, the Bible says that God has this gift of eternal life to everybody in the entire world. There's two kinds of people in the world. The kinds of people that have taken the gift and the kinds of people that haven't taken the gift. Now, let's say I had this Bible and I was gonna give it to you. In order for you to make it yours, all you have to do is receive it, is take it. God says he wants to give eternal life to everybody, but there's only the people that have taken the gift and the people that haven't taken the gift. Now, this is how the Bible says to take the gift. It says in the book of Acts, there's a preacher named Paul, St. Paul, the Apostle Paul. And he was going around preaching about Jesus and he was preaching about uh, salvation and they threw him in jail for it. Now, when he was in jail, he just kept preaching about the Lord. He just kept preaching about Jesus. And one of the jailers in there heard his preaching and believed what he was saying and he wanted eternal life. He wanted to be what the Bible is called saved. The, and here's the verse in Acts chapter 16, verse 30, it says, and he brought and brought them out. Talking about Paul and Silas, these two preachers. He brought them out of their jail cell to speak with them and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a great question. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So they said, the only thing you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Did they tell him to go to church? Did they tell him to put money in the offering plate? No. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, the most famous verse in the entire Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says that because God loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And if we just believe in him, the Bible says he'll give us everlasting life. Jesus says flat out in John 6, 47, it says, he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So let's say there's a guy standing right here. Let's say this guy, he drinks and smokes and he fights and he goes in and out of jail and he's a bad guy. But let's say in his heart, he believes in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he would go to heaven when he dies because he believes in Christ. And let's say there's a guy standing right here. Let's say this guy don't drink, he don't smoke, he doesn't uh, steal things from people, he pays all his bills, he goes to church three times a week, he's a very generous person, a good guy. But let's say in his heart, he does not believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says when he dies, he'll go to hell. So it's not good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. It's people that believe go to heaven and people that don't believe go to hell. Because what these two guys both have in common is they both sin. This guy's sins are probably far worse than his sins, but they still both sin. Therefore, they both have their part in the lake of fire and they both need a savior. Neither one of them can save themselves. The only difference is this guy believed in Jesus Christ for his salvation, and this guy did not. Now, there's a couple things specifically about Jesus we have to believe in order to go to heaven. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So number one is you have to believe that he arose from the dead. His spirit went back into his body and he arose from the dead. Number two is this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus. Number two is you have to believe that Jesus Christ is God. Now people always ask, was Jesus a prophet? Was he a great teacher? Was he a man or was he God? What was he? Well, the Bible calls him God. The Bible is clear that he was God. And here's a verse in the Bible where it just flat out calls him God. There was one of his followers that was stoned to death for preaching about him. And when he died, this was the account. It says, and they stoned Stephen calling upon God. So he's talking to God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit because Jesus Christ is God. Now, number three and number four are kind of intertwined. In all those verses, all it says you have to do to be saved and the entire Bible is just believe. It's only by faith. Now, this is what you have to believe. That when Jesus died and was buried and he rose from the dead, he paid for every sin that you'll ever do. Every sin that you've ever done, every sin you might do today, and every sin that you'll do for the rest of your life. And then if you believe that, he'll give you everlasting life. Now, this is what you have to stop believing. You have to stop believing that it has anything to do with how good or bad you are. I mean this. You can't believe it's by you getting baptized and you believing in Jesus. Or it's because you're a good person, but you also believe in Jesus. You have to believe it's only through his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, just like if I was going to give you this Bible, and let's say I bought it on Amazon. It was not free for me. I paid $1,000 for it on Amazon. It's free for you, though. All you have to do is receive it. The Bible says that Jesus purchased our salvation when he died and was buried and rose from the dead. And now he wants to give it to you as long as you're willing to not trust in your own works anymore and totally believe in his works, in his death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. Now, if you believe that, the Bible says that God will give you everlasting life. Oftentimes, he calls it eternal life. Now, how long does everlasting last? Everlasting lasts forever. Eternal means it goes on forever. Meaning this, once he gives it to you, you can never lose your salvation. It's eternal, it's everlasting. So let's say I was gonna give you this Bible. And let's say I said, here you go, it's free. You don't owe me any money. It's just from me to you, because you're my friend. And I said, here you go. And I said, you can have it forever, I promise. And I gave it to you. And then let's say you did something that made me very mad and I took it back and I broke my promise. That would make me a liar. The Bible says in Titus 1, 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. God promises that it's eternal. It says in John, in 1 John chapter 2, and this is the promise that he hath promised us 
even eternal life. Meaning this, once you get eternal life, you have it forever. There's never any reason that he can take it back from you. It's everlasting. So if I gave you this Bible, or let's pretend like this is eternal life and God gives you eternal life today. And then let's say in a year from now, you commit some awful sin. Let's say you commit murder or you uh, stop going to church or you never get baptized. He cannot take it back because he promised you can have it forever. Now, he will punish us for murder. He will punish us for not going to church and for not uh, following his commands on earth by punishing us in this life. But when we die, we still have eternal life. We'll go to heaven when we die. Now, I was 19 years old when a guy knocked on my door and he showed me the same things I showed you. And he asked me some questions. He said, Donnie, do you believe you're a sinner? And he asked me, he said, do you understand the Bible says we deserve hell for our sins? I'm gonna ask you the same questions and you need to think about them. Do you believe you're a sinner? Do you understand the Bible says because we're all sinners, we all deserve hell. Do you believe Jesus died and was buried and rose from the dead? And he's the only way to heaven. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in him. And do you believe if you got saved and got eternal life, it would be forever. Once you're saved, you're always saved. If you believe that, I'm going to share with you one more verse. The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 13, one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now call upon means ask. We used to say in America several hundred years ago, I'm going to go call upon my neighbor for a cup of sugar. Now we say, I'm going to go ask my neighbor for a cup of sugar. What the what the verse is saying is God has eternal life. And if you put your faith in him and you ask him for it, he'll give it to you. Just like if I had this Bible and I said, if you ask me for it, I'll give it to you. And he said, Pastor Romero, can I please have your Bible? And I said, here you go. Now it's yours. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. It's yours. It's a gift from me to you. God says, I have eternal life. And if by faith you ask me for it, I'll give it to you freely. And when he gives it to you, it's eternal. You can never lose it. Now, if you believed what I've shown you and you want to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and stop trusting your own works to save you and you want to receive eternal life and you want to trust Christ as your savior today, then just bow your head and pray out loud knowing that you're praying for yourself right now. You're going to pray and ask God to give you eternal life. Say, dear father, I know I'm a sinner. I know why I deserve hell. I believe Jesus died and was buried and rose from the dead. Please save me and give me eternal life. I'm only trusting in Jesus Christ to save me. If you prayed that, God heard you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You call upon him and ask him to give you eternal life. The Bible says that he'll give you eternal life.